Hello, everyone, and welcome to a webinar hosted by the Collaborative Conservation and Adaptation Strategy Toolbox, or CCAST. Uh, my name is Matt Graybaugh, and I'm a science coordinator with the Fish and Wildlife Service, Services Science Applications Program. I sit down here in Tucson, Arizona. I am the co-director of CCAST, along with Genevieve Johnson from the Bureau of Reclamation. Um, and we recently, in April of 2020, launched a webinar series focused primarily on control of non-native aquatic species, which is why we're here today. And these webinars are in support of the recently launched non-native Southwest Non-Native Aquatic Species Community of Practice. And with that, I will hand it over to Anna. And Annette, feel free to start sharing your screen. Great, thank you, Matt. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Anna Weinberg, and I'm a CCAST research specialist based at the University of Arizona in Tucson. Um, I am the coordinator of our drought adaptation community of practice, um, as well as support the non-native aquatic species community of practice. Uh, we do a little of everything here at CCAST. Um, but uh, today we have a presentation from Nanette Danielle on bullfrog removal from Yosemite National Park. Uh, Nanette is an environmental protection specialist uh, with the National Park Service. She's worked in the park since 2008 on projects studying and conserving native wildlife, including the Yosemite toad, um, Sierra Nevada yellow-legged frog, and western pond turtle. Much of this work has included an invasive species abatement component. So um, if you have any questions for Nanette during the presentation, please enter them in the chat box as we go. Um, after the presentation, I will help moderate that question and answer period. Uh, and with that, I think I will turn it over to Nanette. Uh, thank you for inviting me um, to come to talk about some of our bullfrog eradication work in Yosemite. Um, so today I'll be sharing with you uh, primarily the work to um, eradicate bullfrogs in Yosemite Valley, but also kind of a sneak peek at our, our um, progress on some other efforts in the park. Um, the first thing I guess I'll start with is just a little bit about myself. I know that um, we're not able to really go to conferences right now and um, participate in the awesome mixers and things, so I figured I'd put a few slides about uh, just about me and who I am. Um, so I've been pestering and harassing invasive species from a pretty young age. This is me with a cane toad. Um, you know, I've loved herps my whole life. My first real book that I, um, you know, was my adored possession was a guide, to, the Audubon Guide to Eastern Reptiles and Amphibians, and I was quite perplexed as a second grader why I could not you know, identify most of my California species that I was flipping logs to discover. Um, but things came together for me when I took a trip to Maine on vacation in fourth grade. Um, and I captured my first bullfrog in Maine and correctly identified it with my Eastern guide. Um, and then I put it in a jar and I brought it back to California with me as a pet. And right, you know, we had it for a while and then it kind of started pooping a lot and smelling and it was like kind of hard to take care of. And so we decided to release it at my grandma's house in the San Francisco Bay Area. So um, not the best, not the best thing to do. And then um, as life continued, I remember in college reading the book um, Out of Eden and Odyssey of Ecological Invasion by Alan Verdick and being very just awestruck at how profound the impacts of these exotic species are exerting on um, native ecosystems. And I, you know, I got nerdier, got deeper into being a herp nerd, and then the karmic forces eventually brought me back to Yosemite on the front lines of um, invasive species control working on bullfrogs. Um, so Yosemite is in my backyard. It's one of the first places I camped as a child, you know, I was born just outside of the park. Um, and it's been so special to get to work on, um, you know, making it a better place um, with all of the amazing people that have worked um, on these projects. So today um, I'm going to kind of orient you to the park. I know that many of you have probably visited our park and many of you um, may have not made it out here yet. So orient you to the park, um, kind of let everyone know what's going on with some of our native frogs. 
Um, quick orientation to bullfrog invasion ecology, although I doubt, um, I doubt many of the people on this will need that. Um, and then review how bullfrogs got established in the valley. Um, we'll kind of let you get to know our field sites, um, some of the methods that we employed to uh, eradicate bullfrogs, um, and then you know what our findings are, the different um, kind of uh, roles that each method has played in our success, and also some of our lessons learned. Um, and then just a quick um, taste of some of the things that are upcoming in the park following this work. So um, the arrow is pointing to Yosemite here, right here. Um, so we're located in central California, just uh, east of San Francisco on the western slope of the Sierra Nevada mountain range. The park is mostly wilderness. There's a few roads intersecting it, but it's largely, um, largely wilderness. The park is almost um, 750, you know, thousand acres, which is pretty large, um, or 11, around 1,100 square miles. Um, we see almost four, visit, four million visitors annually, so um, you can imagine that we have people from California that get time off on the weekends and that come up and recreate during the summer and on the weekends. Um, and we also get international visitors that fly into San Francisco International or LAX and, and they want to see um, Yosemite. Most of these visitors um, are present in Yosemite Valley. So most, most folks that come to our park kind of come in, drive through Yosemite Valley and then head out to somewhere else. And most of them are visiting during the warm months of the year from uh, May to October. So being a national park, um, our, our, per our mission and our enabling legislation is what allows us to um, do all of the things that we do to protect this place. So Park Service mission um, includes, you know, primarily preserving unimpaired natural resources um, for the enjoyment of future generations in the public. And the Organic Act of 1915 is our enabling legislation and there's lots of um, focus on conservation of scenery and natural, um, natural objects and wildlife. Um, and again, this, this idea of it being unimpaired for the enjoyment of future generations. So we're not charged like the Forest Service or BLM with having to balance a lot of competing uses in the same ways that other public lands are, um, which is unique. And our responsibility to protect these, you know, natural places and their native wildlife is pretty clear um, in our mission and our, our enabling legislation. And, and the noise that the bullfrogs calling in the night, you know, really should not be part of the Yosemite Valley experience or any other, um, you know, experience in the park where, you know, folks want to come here to see our native, um, native animals. They want to experience um, the grandeur of the park. So um, regardless of the park being mostly wilderness and highly inaccessible to most people, um, native herpetofauna have declined or been extirpated um, nonetheless. So um, in the early 1900s, Joseph Grinnell um, did some survey transects across this part um, of California and you know, documented animals um, as he saw them. Some of the native animals to our park are California red-legged frog up here, Yosemite toad, western toad, Pacific chorus frog, foothill yellow-legged frog, Sierra Nevada yellow-legged frog, and western pond turtle. And over the years, we've had extirpations of California red-legged frog in the park, so um, more on this, but they were extirpated from the park. Also extirpation of um, foothill yellow-legged frog. And we've had animals, you know, become listed. We still have Sierra Nevada yellow-legged frogs, but they're, you know, listed as endangered. We have um, the red-legged frog being, being listed as threatened, the Yosemite toad being listed as threatened, and the foothill yellow-legged frog being listed as state endangered, and pond turtle um, under U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service review um, right now. So regardless of, you know, the best efforts, we still have um, some, a lot of work to do. And when, in the 1990s, when Drost and Fellers came through and resurveyed Grinnell's transects, they found declines in, in almost everything they looked at. 
as far as the um, aquatic animals, including, you know, the frogs and toads. So um, it's fairly interesting. And I do also want to point out that we have Sierra newts. I didn't include them on this slide, but it's another one of those aquatic species that we do have. Um, and invasive species are implicated in, in most of these declines with non-native fish and bullfrogs being, you know, the most notable contributors. So bullfrog biology, I'm assuming that most folks um, are, are pretty tuned into this right now, but just go over it. Um, so we're talking about Lithobates catespianus or, you know, Rana previously, um, Lika, some people are, are uh, abbreviating it. So these frogs are native to um, North America, east of the Rocky Mountains. They're invasive in over 40 countries and, you know, on four continents. So pretty um, pervasive invasion across um, the world. They're a voracious scape limited predator, which means that they'll eat anything that fits in their mouth. And it, as you can see from these photos, um, they'll eat birds, they'll eat mammals, they'll eat other vertebrates, other frogs. They'll eat invertebrates. Um, and in Yosemite specifically, we've recorded them having eaten uh, rodents, various different rodents and birds, and also, um, also Western pond turtle hatchling. They're highly fecund, so they lay these large gelatinous egg masses in the spring and early summer. And females can lay clutches of, you know, 20,000 or more eggs, which is, you know, pretty astounding. And those eggs need water that's between 15 and 32 degrees Celsius to develop, with them developing quicker towards that higher end of the range. And in Yosemite, um, the tadpoles take two seasons to metamorphose. I know that, you know, there are other places where that's not the case, but um, with what we're working on here, that's what we're finding. And these frogs are having impacts on native um, wildlife, including direct predation, competition impacts, um, implications in disease spread, and also displacement where, you know, their presence is being linked to, you know, decreases in biodiversity. Um, so um, we embarked on an effort in the 90s to remove bullfrogs from Yosemite Valley, and this effort has spanned, um, you know, a lot of, a lot, large um, breadth of time. Um, and also a, a large number of people have worked on this project. So I just want to acknowledge my co-authors, Colleen Kamaroff did an incredible amount of work pulling together this data to try to make it understandable so that other folks could learn from it um, and, you know, learn from what we've done. Um, but that was, you know, that was not an easy effort. It's, it's a messy data set that's been test, touched by a lot of people and things have changed a lot um, from person to person and over the years. Um, Rob Grasso, the uh, aquatic program manager here at Yosemite National Park. Rebecca Rising, who was an amazing technician that was responsible for um, kind of that getting rid of the last few bullfrog phase, the no stone unturned approach, and she pulled together um, much data from previous years. Travis Espinosa um, was a previous aquatic biologist here at the park and also worked as a technician on this project in the early years, um, and Karen Goldberg for University of Washington that's helped us out with um, eDNA. So um, to give you an idea of where we have bullfrog habitat in the park, um, the park spans a huge range of elevations from about 4,000 feet in the valley all the way up to, you know, these high Sierra, you know, 10,000 foot peak um, sort of habitats. Most of our habitat is high elevation. So um, this is one area of the park that has bullfrogs or potential habitat. It's in the northwest of the park. These areas are around 6,000 feet between 5,500 and 6,500 feet. Um, this includes the vicinity of Miguel Meadows, this right here is um, Hetch Hetchy Reservoir, and this is the Eleanor Reservoir, which for folks that are familiar with this area, those are kind of important landmarks. Um, this area is in the Tuolumne River drainage, and there's some spot areas right in this vicinity that were occupied by bullfrogs from the 1970s um, until present. And Yosemite Valley, apologies for the background noise. Um, Yosemite Valley is the other area that we have um, potential habitat for bullfrogs. Um, Yosemite Valley is, the, is in the Merced River drainage, kind of running down following that polygon. 
um, elevations around 4,000 feet. And this area was occupied by bullfrogs from the 1950s until 2019. So I want to kind of let you know what it's like in Yosemite Valley because the topography and some of those, um, you know, physical constraints on what the river does and what the land does really give us, um, have had led to our success. So uh, Yosemite Valley is a glacially carved valley bordered by steep cliffs and cascading waterfalls. You can see that those cliffs rise pretty precipitously from the valley floor. You can see the Merced River coming down the middle here kind of meandering. Um, this is Half Dome over here just to kind of get your um, bearings about you. The valley bottom is around 4,000 feet and the rim is around 7,000 feet and it's about a mile wide. So you can see this is about a mile wide, kind of a long narrow valley. Um, and then this picture up here kind of shows you another depiction of the valley with this landmark of Half Dome and then over here Hetch Hetchy Reservoir. So we have, um, you know, the weather patterns here. We have snowy, cold winters and some hot, dry summers. Is um, It's kind of dynamic, lots of, of change between the seasons. Um, and due to the cliffs and the limited sun, the, the cliffs cause a limited sun exposure. So at the tails of the day, the temperature drops pretty precipitously um, as the sun goes down. So the Merced River is a wild and scenic river. Um, it tends to be slow, cool, and lazy in the summer. But in the, you know, the winter and the spring runoff, it's, you know, ice cold, very swelling, sweeping fast. Um, and the spring runoff is, is pretty intense at times. So this is just data from one of our um, gauges at, at Happy Isles. So we have a couple of gauges in the park, but I just wanted to give other managers kind of an idea of some of the hydrographs um, that we experience here. And, and they fluctuate very widely between like drought years and like heavy water years. But this is one from 2020 that just kind of shows kind of an average year. Um, and you can see here that it's getting up to, you know, 2000 CFS in the spring runoff, peak runoff. And then you can also notice here that it doesn't really get above 15 degrees Celsius for very long. Um, for a very long period of time. And I just want to point out that that 15 degrees Celsius is the minimum for bullfrog um, egg mass development for embryonic development. So um, in our area, off channel habitat and shallow areas are really important um, habitat for breeding habitat for bullfrogs. Also, um, so as I've pointed out in the past, on three sides of our valley, we we're basically bounded by these like towering cliffs and waterfalls, um, which provide physical kind of barriers for um, bullfrogs. And then we also have on the way out, if you follow the river out to the downstream effects, there's a portion of really kind of gnarly rapids and narrows um, kind of near park line as, as the river leaves our park. And so for these reasons, um, it's highly uh, unlikely that we would have bullfrogs migrating back up into the park from out of the park um, just because the the rapids are you know fairly formidable for a good portion of the year and then there's really not very much off-channel habitat in that stretch where bullfrogs could kind of like hop from pool to pool and make their way up without encountering um, kind of the gnarly section of the river if that makes sense. So in most years um, bullfrogs are precluded from using this using this section because of the um, conditions. Also, um, our river throughout the valley doesn't really have um, a huge abundance of off-channel habitat or undercut banks, like fairly, you know, moderate to low complexity, I would say, compared to other rivers I've been into. And a big reason for that is um, right here, there was a terminal moraine. So when this area was a glacier, um, that glacier receded about 4,000 years ago and there was a big rock pile located where this arrow is located that used to dam up, kind of act as a dam and um, make Yosemite a much more swampy place uh, to be. So in 1876 under Galen Clark that terminal moraine, which again is just a, a collection of rocks that was pushed at the foot of the glacier into almost a dam situation, 
um, that was blasted out with dynamite. And so that effectively drained a lot of the areas in Yosemite Valley that held water for a lot longer than what they do now. Um, it actually lowered the river level by an average of about four feet. So that's you know pretty significant. And then in addition to that, in areas where the river had meandered and left behind you know, S curves that eventually would be off channel habitat, some of that was filled in um, when white people came into the valley was filled in as, as dump sites because they're like, oh, look at this, there's a depression, let's we'll put some trash in it. So um, a number of those sites are present in the valley and are being remediated and there's talks about um, potentially restoring some of those into off-channel habitat again. Um, and there was also some dewatering of meadows using subsurface drain tiles, for example, in Royal Arches Meadow, which is um, kind of up in this area. And the thing that we do have an abundance of is visitors. So when you think about um, trying to do a an eradication program for bullfrogs in the valley, just think of all these visitors that are also in this valley wanting to see wildlife, maybe not understanding the invasive species problem. Um, and that just adds a different dimension, kind of being one of the most popular tourist destinations um, within driving distance from San Francisco International and LAX. So bullfrogs were, we believe that bullfrogs were first introduced to Yosemite Valley um, at the Iwani Hotel. And anyone who has been to Yosemite has probably seen the Iwani Hotel. It's a very you know, famous um, historic structure that we have in our park. It's a National Historic Landmark, just gorgeous, amazing, luxurious hotel. Um, during that time, a, uh, a pool was constructed there and designed to be a reflecting pond so that you know, the Iwani Hotel guests could ponder life and gaze into the pool and look at the grandeur of the park reflected from it. Um, but as it turns out, if you don't maintain it very well, it, it turns out just to be like a pretty mucky, gross little pond, as you can see from this photo. And we believe that this was the first site for bullfrog introductions into Yosemite Valley um, in the 1950s. Frogs were present um, throughout other areas. Get down. I'm sorry. The dogs are like going crazy. One moment. I'm sorry. I'm going to need to remedy this. That's okay, Nanette. Everybody is critters moving around in the background, too. Okay, I apologize for that. Um, no worries. Anyway, so the, the bullfrogs were first introduced to the Iwani Pond in the 1950s. They were present in many areas around California at that time, um, so it would not have been hard for someone to get, you know, a hold of them. And word on the street is that it was a, a Wani um, hotel staff member who felt nostalgic towards bullfrogs and thought that the pond needed frogs, such as bullfrogs. So they were first introduced in the 50s, is what we believe, and then the first time that they were seen in the in the pond, like, you know, actually recorded in, um, you know, verifiable observations was in 1955. And then by the 1970s, they were established throughout the valley. So I'll kind of give you guys a little more familiar with some of our field sites. Um, I want to be able to give you more information than what's in the paper so that you can kind of really understand what we were dealing with and apply that in the best way possible to your own scenario if you're trying to combat these these guys. So on this map, um, red is some breeding sites. So there's a little one up here, 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 and then purple is like some decent areas that are, you know, have nice shallow either off-channel habitat or, you know, areas that are nice and shallow, slow-moving, um, that are decent habitat during the year. And the breeding sites are places where we actually, you know, detected breeding. So this is the Iwani Reflection Pond, another um, not super gorgeous photo of the muck pond that people can reflect on life while looking at. This is the, this is close to there, so next closest place, um, known as Camp Six. And there's a series of two little ponds there. They're fairly small, but they are deep and they retain water from, for the whole year. 
and you can see oops, you can see in the background here this is the river coming through so these are you know just over like a little sandbar this is Cook's Meadow. This is one of those sites that is actually fairly large. Um, early in the season, it's a big flooded meadow with kind of a stream running down the middle of it. And then as the season progresses and things dry, um, you know, water is only held in kind of a few places. And then this is our cathedral site. Um, this is one of the sites where one of the last bullfrogs, you know, the last ones was kind of holding out. Um, but you can see not, not a huge amount of, um, of off-channel habitat here. And then this is um, Waski Pond. This is an area where there's a culvert outflow that comes into here and also a spring. So you can see over here, there's quite a bit of water that's holding and this, this stays wet most of the year, but um, trends to retract pretty well when things dry out. And then this is our V6 site. This is a site that's a really small little pond and you can kind of see the river back here. Um, it's some off-channel habitat that's connected to the river and it's not a very big site, but it, it's pretty deep and it holds water um, year round. So that was one of the problematic ones that we found bullfrogs breeding in um, kind of late in the game. So um, this is the guy that started it all. This is Steve Thompson starting in the 1990s, sporadically removing bullfrogs. Um, and he was tenacious. He, you know, in the 1990s, I, you know, those of you who remember what was going on then, we had like a really bad bear problem where bears were like going completely rogue and like breaking into people's cars and doing all this stuff. And he had a very limited staff. So he was mostly dealt dealing with um, all of the bear um, nightmare that was Yosemite at the time, but still found time in his busy life to escape and put some waders on and go after the bullfrogs. And so I, he always got a certain twinkle in his eye when he went after bullfrogs. And Steve um, passed away suddenly. Uh, and so a lot of the data, a lot of the data when, when it was just him going out is kind of lost um, as far as how many you know, individuals that he removed, but it was very sporadic and not recorded super well. So just want to point that out. In 2005, Steve was able to get a grant money to hire two technicians to really hit the bullfrog problem hard for you know, a solid entire summer season. Then between 2006 and 2015, our efforts were pretty sporadic. We had a couple of seasons where we had you know, folks, one to two technicians that were like mostly on, on this project, but then we're also helping out with fish eradication or you know other bear management or other sort of wildlife pro um, projects, but between 2016 and 20 or 2006 and 2015, the efforts that we had towards this were pretty um, sporadic. As far as like some years we had a lot of effort, and other years there was you know very little. And then between 2015 and 2019, NPS began surveillance and monitoring. We used eDNA. And we were really trying to root out those last few individuals so that we could be confident that populations weren't going to blow up again if we let it go because it got down to us believing that there's just a few individuals left. And in general for all of this the bullfrogs are active between May and September again depending on um, you know the year and, and how much uh, snow we got but that's generally when the crews were working. So um, we focused really heavily especially early on on breeding surveys so crews would go out during daylight hours and just search breeding habitat for egg masses and get them out, just scoop them out. And they would scoop the egg masses um, and tadpoles with dip nets if they found tadpoles. So those are some photos you can see in this top one, there's bullfrog egg mass, little black dots, kind of early embryonic development. And then once the season progressed, they would also work at night. The crews would go out at night using high lumen headlamps um, to locate bullfrogs. And then that high powered light makes it so that they get stunned and they won't run or you know hop away or take cover when you are approaching them so that you can grab them with a dip net or spear them with a spear or grab them with your hand. Um, and so that was the majority of, of that nighttime work was focused on adult animals. We also um, used a pellet rifle and line and lure to get difficult ones, like the ones that were evading capture efforts, because 
Um, sometimes, you know, there's just the habitats too complex to get in there without, you know, completely crashing around and having them, you know, take cover. Um, or, you know, the ones that are a little bit far, if you can't get in there with waders without flooding your waders, um, the line and lure and the pellet rifle were really helpful. And then animals throughout the work in Yosemite Valley um, were either euthanized through pithing, you know, if you spear an animal, you don't want to like wait for the MS-222 to set in, you want to kill it as soon as possible because it's um, more humane that way. Um, and then animals that were hand grabbed unharmed were euthanized through submersion in MS-222, which is a fish anesthetic that they absorb through their skin. We also utilized um, manipulation of like hydro period. So this is, this was really helpful at the Iwani pond, luckily because um, one of our bullfrog hotspots was a man-made pond. We were able to actually drain the pond. So you can see um, the gross pond at the top and then this is what it looks like drained. And this is Travis Espinosa, one of the other co-authors standing in the, in the drained pond. And this was kind of a win-win situation because um, folks at the Awani, they don't like to have the, na the nasty pond for their visitors to gaze upon. So it kind of worked out where we were like, hey, we'll clean the bullfrogs out of it. And they're like, cool, we'll take the algae out of it and it'll be a better place for everyone. So we drained it a few times, um, you know, with in, in coordination with wildlife where we went out there and actually, you know, got the bullfrogs out and helped with that effort. And now that there's not bullfrogs left in there, the Iwani staff actually manage the pond actively and they coordinate with our park aquatic ecologists to make sure that their draining of the pond um, doesn't inadvertently, you know, kill native wildlife such as the chorus frogs that are breeding in there. So we make sure we drain it after they have metamorphosed. So the surveillance and environmental DNA, this stuff kind of came in at a later date. We did a lot of traditional visual encounter surveys using that Fellers and Friel protocol. Um, but, you know, we came to a point where there was really diminishing returns where we really weren't seeing anything. And so that's where it was like, well, are we seeing anything because they're not there? Or are we seeing anything, be we're not seeing anything because they're just at such low densities that you'd have to survey every day for like a year to like detect one. Um, so we had crews collecting environmental DNA from bullfrog sites um, from 2015 to 2018. And, you know, basically that involves scooping water. Various amounts and different protocols were used um, and they kind of changed as we honed our expertise. But, you know, the main component of that is you scoop water, you put it through a cellulose nitrate filter that's I think like 45 microns and use either a hand pump or there's plug-in pumps that you can use. But, you know, most of what we used in the field was just this little hand, um, hand held brake bleeder pump um, that you can get at like any auto parts store um, to get the, get the water to come and suction through the filter. And then we would send those filters to the University of Washington um, preserved in ethanol. And then they would run the genetic analysis to tell us if there was bullfrogs. We also employed song meters um, for this phase. Sometimes we'd get reports from, you know, other wildlife staff or folks saying, hey, you know, we heard a bullfrog or we saw one. So we put out song meters to see if we could use that to help hone our efforts to get those last individuals. And also at this kind of surveillance stage, the community engagement was really important. By this point, many people knew what we were doing. So Valley residents, other wildlife staff, other resource staff would say, oh, we heard one or we saw one or we think we saw one. And we'd kind of like follow up on those to try to hone if those were credible or if there was frogs where they're saying there was. So um, I'll move into some of the, our findings. So um, the bar graph depicts the number of bullfrogs removed in Yosemite Valley from 20, 2005 to 2019. And like I mentioned before, these numbers are likely low estimates because the data collection wasn't super solid, especially in the earlier years. And the numbers, um, recorded kind of vary. And then before 2005, we did not have good data. And, you know, that data was lost with the individual who collected it. Um, and then just another note that bullfrogs removed between 2008 and 2012 were totaled um, together in the 2012 column because they weren't differentiated by year. So um, that's not ideal, but it is what it is. And then the pie graphs are the percentage of animals removed from each site between those years. 
and the site types were breeding flooded versus an unspecified. So you can kind of get an idea of um, what we found. So we, cord we recorded over 8,000 individuals that we were removed, 44 egg masses, you know, 7,000, over 7,000 larvae, 67 subadults, and um, 5,000, five, um, sorry, 553 adults. So the, the big take home here is we removed like 86% in the first year of effort. So one year of really concerted effort um, was, was huge. You know, it, it really, that was the year that we put the most effort into this as far as getting rid of the bulk of the numbers. And after this year, the way that native animals in Yosemite Valley experienced their habitat was likely very different. Um, so, you know, eradication from the pr perspective of getting every last individual versus like functional eradication where you're like, yes, there are a few left, we're gonna have to deal with that. But all in all functional eradication, you know, was more or less um, achieved with just this first couple 2005's effort in 2006 by a really concerted effort. Um, and the majority of the bullfrogs that we removed were from breeding locations. And that's just, you know, the kind of habitat that we have, that's where they were hanging out. This is another graph kind of showing just like the distribution across those field sites that I showed you. So the Awani Pond, the introduction site, accounted for most of the individuals that were removed, followed closely by Camp Six and Cook Meadows, or Cook's Meadow. And these are the two sites that are really the closest to Awani Pond. So even though they spread throughout the valley, you know, even after as many years as they were there from the 50s, we really still only removed the most individuals from the sites that were closest to the introduction site. And this is some of our environmental DNA data. So in 2015, we collected um, water samples at four breeding sites and we got three positive detects. So that wasn't super promising. Um, and then in 2016, we kind of like upped the effort and collected it, collected water from 11 breeding sites um, and slack water sites. And we got two positive detections. So that was more encouraging that, okay, we're, you know, still have some work to do, but we're getting there. And then in 18, um, 2018, we collected it in six breeding and slack water sites based on the ones that had had previous detections and we only got one positive detect. So we had not observed frogs before doing this environmental data DNA. We hadn't observed frogs in the valley since 2015, but we had detected them in DNA. So if we had just relied on visual encounter surveys, we may have, it, we may have concluded that our work there was done when it actually wasn't done. So, um, in 2019, you know, there was an individual that a bear crew um, staff member alerted that he had heard calling in Cook's Meadow. Just slide. And this is a photo of one of our field staff, Grayson, who was incredibly tenacious and after many, many hours of hunting had captured that last cook, what we believe to be the last individual that was um, found calling at Cook's Meadow. And then the other thing that I want to point out too is that we got really lucky with kind of our last years of 2015 leading up to that. Those were drought years here, which means that a lot of our off-channel habitat dried up and really made it um, a lot easier to be certain that we didn't have animals hanging out in pockets. So we got really lucky with kind of our last years coinciding with low water years. So this is some data that um, I want to bring you guys up to speed on. It's hard because I, I don't want to use too much time, but this is some work that is ongoing right now in the Swamp Lake, Gravel Pit Lake, and Miguel Meadows area. That's that area up here, kind of near um, between Eleanor and Hetch Hetchy Reservoir up in this area. And so this is an ongoing project. Um, it's in the back country, so this is only accessible by foot or by horseback. Um, the sites are around 5,500 feet in elevation. In 2015, we started working here. Um, and this is also the Swamp Lake and Gravel Pit Lake sites were the only place in the valley where we had previous detections recorded of California red-legged frog and they had become extirpated. And then in the 70s, we started seeing bullfrogs at these sites. So in 2015, we started scouting, surveying, planning. As you can see from this Google Earth um, 
imagery, you know, these two lakes are fairly obvious, but there's this lake, there's this lake, there's these little depressions, there's some areas where water holds right here. This is Milgel Meadows is what they call this area. But um, so in 2015, we poured over a bunch of the um, lake layers that we had in ArcMap and also went into the Google Earth imagery to really find um, if there was areas of water that we weren't aware of. So we surveyed over 70 different um, pond or lake sites in that vicinity. The cool thing again with 2015 coming off the heels of a number of drought years is that 20 of those 70 plus sites were actually had gone completely dry. So we were able to kind of like limit our bullfrog um, efforts with that knowledge. We had bullfrog observations at four lakes plus, plus um, at, in this Miguel Meadows area. We did not observe bullfrogs at five lakes where we had recorded previous observations, so that was encouraging. And most of the sites, so at these other 70 sites, a number of those sites um, had eDNA work that was done at them, and most of them were all negative. So that was really encouraging too. Um, we were able to use that, you know, the eDNA, the surveys, going over our different kind of aerial coverages to really make sure that we were getting all the reasonable habitat to search. Um, allowed us to really get in and plan this effort in a much more um, stepwise way. So to give you an idea of what some of these sites look like, um, this is Swamp Lake here up at the top. Swamp Lake is about eight hectares. Um, Gravel Pit Lake down here in the lower right, this is our other uh, main site, and this one was around 2.2 hectares. And then there's a few smaller lakes um, that have kind of some complex habitat um, in the area. So here's some of the numbers coming out of there. You can see that we really started our effort. We did a little bit of work in 2015, but the main bulk of the effort started in 2017. 2018 and 2019, we also had pretty heavy effort there. So between 2015 and 2019, we removed, you know, over 9,000 individual frogs from Gravel Pit Lake and also, you know, over 180 egg masses. And during that same time span, we removed over 3,000 individuals from Swamp Lake and over 30 egg masses. And again, you know, something to really look at is functional eradication has been more or less achieved at Gravel Pit Lake. We're kind of at the point there where we're hunting out the last individuals. And 87, so almost 100% of the adult bullfrogs, we believe, have been removed from Gravel Pit. And then close to that, about 87%, we believe, have been removed from Swamp Lake. So we're getting close at those sites, which is really um, encouraging. I mean, I remember there was a time that you go out there and it's just, at night, it's just complete eye shine. I mean, you put a light up to your eyes and it's like, they're everywhere. So it's pretty cool um, to be able to say that. And I do wanna also just stress that this is unpublished data right here. So there will be more to come in the future, but um, we're definitely moving forward on this one, pretty cool. And this is just another depiction of the same numbers. Um, we removed, you know, in 2017, the bulk of the individuals. So in just one year, this was the year that they focused really heavily on Gravel Pit Lake. So 1,200 adults in 2017 at Gravel Pit and around 700 at Swamp Lake. And then um, we're anticipating that these sites, Gravel Pit will be completed by 2022 and Swamp Lake by 2023. And just to give you an hour, an, an and an idea of some of the effort that was put in. So in 2017, we had um, at Gravel Pit 261 hours and 121 hours at Swamp. And then um, in 2018, 73 hours at Gravel Pit and kind of shifting to put more effort into Swamp Lake. And so that's kind of how we've had to allocate it because of the crews. So lessons learned, um, motivation. So I just want to I guess underscore that functional eradication at many of these sites was possible after after a few years of really concerted effort. And when I'm saying functional eradication, I'm thinking of it from the perspective of like the native animals that are there. Um, like it made a big difference probably in their life right away. And just to also remember when we try to think about bullfrog eradication, I think a lot of people get really, um, it seems insurmountable. I mean, it's just with an animal that's so fecund and can hide out in all these different areas, you're like, God, is it even possible? Like. Um, but just to remember that, you know, invasion and spread is like the last point in a pretty long continuum where animals have to first be introduced, they have to survive, they have to reproduce, then they establish in those areas. Um, 
hitting the different, you know, spots along this continuum can be really helpful. It's not all or nothing. And it, it may take many years um, to prevent reestablishment and to follow up to make sure that you're getting those last few individuals. And it's also important to realize that not all habitat is good habitat and that not all habitat is good breeding or rearing habitat. Um, some of the planning lessons, we wish we had planned um, better data collection and more methodical visual encounter surveys before beginning the eradication effort um, in the valley. That data would be really cool to have now and we don't have it for, for some of um, those areas. But in Swamp Lake and Gravel Pit Lake, we do have this data and it'll be really interesting to see how that plays out um, in the long run. Um, we also wish we had started integrating PDAs and making data collection um, you know, geo-referenced earlier than we did. And one of the big things for planning is just really getting to know the temperature and the flow and how they vary you know, between seasons and then between different water years knowing that can really help you hone your efforts on like where do you need to prioritize and maximize your return on effort. And then plan for their, the crews to spread their effort out as well. Um, and then on drought years, you know, we had to make sure that, that really if you know that you're having a drought year, like those are years that you really don't want to slip off on, on your efforts. So here's some um, data from the Swamp Gravel Pit story. When you don't have a lot of money or time, you know, how do we prioritize? One, stay on top of egg masses. This could, you know, result in thousands and thousands of animals never, you know, even entering the habitat. So find where the egg masses are laid and when they are laid and what temperatures, you know, you see, seem to find them um, and maximize your return. So you can see on this data that in, in 2015, there was zero egg masses. And then two years later, we had, you know, 4,000 subadults that were captured. And then in 2017, they got 118 egg masses and you come down to how many subadults were captured and it's so, so much less, just 200. So the egg masses do make a really big difference. Um, and they're a lot of bang for your buck as far as, you know, you can predict where they're going to show up and when they're going to show up. And then you can be there to scoop them once they show up. Um, the other thing is go after the adult life stage is hard. I mean, a lot of population modeling has shown that adult survivorship is really important to amphibian population stability. So we can reverse that and use that um, to our advantage. So definitely go after your adult stages really hard and hit again, hit really hard on drought years if you can. So a word on metamorphs and tads, don't focus on metamorphs and tads. Metamorphs in our area seem to have really high winter and spring mortality. So, you know, going after them is like, if you have time, great, but definitely spend your efforts on the adults and the egg masses. But if you are going to put effort towards metamorphs, if you just have like an army of volunteers that really want to get out and do some bullfrog work, um, try to get them late in the summer as they're emerging because they just seem dumber and easier to get at that point. So capture methods, um, definitely make sure you have a bright headlamp. 200 plus lumens plus a handheld flashlight so that you can hold it next to your binoculars and really get um, a good view of what's there. Using rubber band loaded slings and hand grabbing and dip nets and pellet guns are super successful. Approaching, approaching with float tubes in areas that are, or that are difficult to get to by foot um, has been really effective. They don't seem to recognize the float tube as a predator in a way that they do like a lot of the terrestrial approaching sort of people. And we have not, we tried out traps like that were baited with um, vibrating lures. And we've also tried an e-frogger attachment, which is an attachment that goes on a Smith root um, electrofisher. And we, we really didn't have a lot of success with that. So, um, you know, if you can make them work great, but we found that with the densities we were looking at that actually just having people out there doing it was much more effective than dealing with all of the gear for those other two um, methods. Um, you can use dip nets with really fine mesh to remove all of the eggs. Sometimes the traditional dip, dip nets that we have are not fine enough. There's eggs that slip through them. So um, buying and investing in dip nets with a really fine mesh can help get the eggs out more effectively. Um, again, if you can manipulate hydro period to use pond draining, um, that was really, really helpful for us. Um, and also remember that you can often modify the habitat by clipping willows or like pulling 
branches out or like, you know, making it so that when you're there at night hunting these things that you don't have them just being like, hey, hey, like in a branch area that you're like, oh, I can't get in there. So, um, and then again, using those seasonal changes in your um, field sites to plan the assault. And then this is some lessons learned on getting the last individuals when you move into that surveillance phase. Um, the last ones tend to be really cunning. And so you need people that are stealthy and persistent. Um, it's pretty hard to hire a crew for that phase, just because again, you know, you'll survey a lot of hours or be going after these frogs for a lot of time with like not getting anything. And you know, it's, it's, it's a mentally taxing activity to be so astute and be ready to pounce and ready to stab a frog and then just constantly not be seeing them. It kind of can drive you crazy. Um, it helps a lot to vary the crew activities as well, just because again, a lot of people do struggle with like during the beginning phases, like killing a lot of animals. And then in the end phases, like doing a lot of surveying and not seeing anything. So kind of passing them around and letting them do activities with different crews if you can. Um, and then, you know, making sure that the crew has the ability and the freedom to survey all the shoreline. Like, don't ask them just to survey where they've previously been found. When you get to this last ones, no, no stone unturned is kind of the approach you want to take, is to, like, survey all the shoreline, survey all potential habitat, because we did find animals when we started getting to that area that were in places we didn't expect them to be. And at that point too, the eDNA is a really indispensable tool to kind of give you an idea of like, are there any animals left in this area? Where should I focus? And then community involvement, as previously mentioned, is really helpful too. So backcountry tips. Um, we embarked on an adventure basically doing backcountry eradication at Swamp and Gravel Pit. Um, again, these float tubes are super lightweight and packable and they allow you to access um, areas sometimes better than on foot. And then in the backcountry, we used Oragel that was applied topically for euthanasia and then pissed the animals as a backup method. And then we packed out animals during peak removal when we were getting a lot of animals using bear canisters and bags. So that was a big effort and not super fun. But um, then later on, when we were starting to get lower numbers, we used lake burials where we would sink the animals into the lake. Um, and that was looked at by an NPS veterinarian and everything with the Oragel and making sure that that wouldn't um, impact um, the aquatic environment negatively. So in moving into some of our next steps, um, in Yosemite Valley, we have began restoring um, native frogs. So California red-legged frogs started to be introduced to Yosemite Valley in 2016. And they were introduced at the sites that used to be previously occupied by bullfrogs. The 1,000th frog was released in 2019. So these animals came from a source site in the north of here in the Sierra Nevadas. Um, those animals were picked up as egg masses from those sites. They were brought to the San Francisco Zoo for captive rearing. And then they were reduced as, or um, introduced as um, like subadult sort of frogs back into Yosemite Valley, like large subadults. And we've observed breeding at multiple of these introduction sites, which is really um, encouraging. Park staff are studying these frogs and, you know, putting um, radio tracking them and, you know, monitoring their movements and stuff. And we've had successful metamorphosis as well at four locations. So they're, they're breeding in Yosemite Valley with success, which is super exciting. And then at Swamp Lake and Gravel Pit Lake, um, we expect, as previously mentioned, to finish eradication activities for bullfrogs there at 2022 and 2023. And we are collecting this year egg masses um, from that same Sierra Nevada, or from the same um, location in the Sierra foothills. We're collecting egg masses that will be reared at the San Francisco Zoo and then released back into Swamp Lake and Gravel Pit Lake, hopefully in 2023. So, um, at this point, I just want to acknowledge the huge amount of people that have worked on this project. This list is mostly folks that have worked on the Yosemite Valley um, bullfrog removal. But if we were to add the crews that are tracking the red-legged frogs and add the crews that have worked on um, the work in Swamp Lake and Gravel Pit, this, this list would be much longer. So I just want to acknowledge that, that there's many field staff that are not on this list yet. So I um, also just want to acknowledge Yosemite Conservancy, San Francisco Zoo, California Department of Fish and Wildlife, and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, 
SCA Nature Bridge and University of Washington that have all provided um, incredible support for various um, aspects of this project. And at this point, um, I can take any questions. Awesome. Thanks so much, Nanette. Um, such a wonderful presentation. And yeah, like some folks are saying in the comments, a really awesome conservation success story. It's always great to get those because sometimes they feel far and few between. Um, we are nearing the top of the hour, but we have a lot of really wonderful questions coming in that we'd love to have some time to answer. Um, Nanette, how do you feel staying on to like 2.15 to answer questions? Do you have capacity for that or you have a I can deadline? Yeah, I can totally stand and that's, that's fine. Sweet. Awesome. So um, yeah, just folks know, uh, you know, when you need to go, you need to go, but we'll stay on here until 2.15 to um, get lots of really great questions answered. Um, as Matt said there, uh, please feel free to keep dropping questions in the chat, but um, I'm going to go ahead and get us started. So uh, there are a couple questions coming in about reinvasion potential, and you kind of talked some about the geography of the system um, at the beginning, which was really great. But you know, are do you uh, questions about the nearest populations downstream of the valley? Um, are you taking ongoing control actions to prevent reinvasion? So the there are populations downstream. Um, especially like right out of the park in El Portel, there's some population there, but they're not super high. It tends to fluctuate between our water years. Like whenever we get a really big water year, it like flushes them out and puts them downstream even farther. Um, there's not a ton of off channel habitat, which is great for um, flushing them out. Um, but we've, we are not taking a lot of effort as far as uh, actually removing them from that portion of the river. We have worked with the Upper Merced Watershed Council kind of trying to drum up community support because again, I feel like a lot of the same principles, if we can just have folks show up at the breeding locations um, and know where those egg masses are happening that maybe even high schoolers could help us with that. But those, those relationships are still in development and um, we are pretty lucky in that I feel like our reinvasion potential is is fairly low. I feel like if we were getting a lot of reinvasion, we would see higher numbers at those sites that were farther away from Awani Pond, instead of seeing most of our captured individuals all be close to where they were first introduced. Does that make sense? Yeah, definitely. Um, that's great. Yeah, I mean, and we had had, you, you've spoken to some of this throughout, but had multiple questions you know, again, really curious about those difficult ones um, and the associated monitoring that you've continued on doing to con confirm their absence and your succeed, your success in removal. So maybe like where that sits, you know, presently. That one I would have to talk more about to Rob Grasso to find out where they're at with that. Um, but in general, we do have a working relationship with University of Washington and they had been using eDNA and taking them from the sites where, you know, good bullfrog habitat is present and where we'd previously found individuals. So um, the park is probably going to continue that. It's, it's fairly low cost and pretty easy to go and collect that data just as like, and again, if, if people say, oh, we think we heard them like from the community, then we're going out and trying to be present with that. But we have also had a lot of kind of like boots on the ground because a lot of those areas that previously had bullfrogs now have red-legged frogs that are um, a pretty big deal to keep following up on and they've been out there doing radio telemetry. So our crews also have a good amount of presence in the field um, in a lot of that ideal habitat as well, where we would expect to see those animals turn up. Yeah. Great. Um, one, yeah, clarifying question. Do you know what were the population estimates, estimates before 2005? There was a, I mean, there was a lot. I'm not sure about the estimate, but I mean, like at night you could hear them calling and it was like, it was, you know, pretty cacophonous. Um, but that's, that's one of those things that I wish was different um, is that we really don't have like good, you know, protocol VES before they, the effort started because Steve Thompson was just kind of going out on on his own where he had time to go out and get the twinkle in his eye and go after the bullfrogs. So he didn't, we don't have those records. Um, and uh, you know, I think that they weren't well recorded and then he passed away, which made it even harder because we weren't able to get 
for this paper, you know, we weren't able to get like a, a verbal um, report of kind of how things were like in the late 80s, early 90s when he started thinking about doing this. But we do have that data for the swamp and gravel pit area. And, you know, in the future, I'm sure that will end up being incorporated into a talk. Yeah, certain degree of messiness when it comes to field work, right? Um, so there's some, a lot of really great questions about the tools that you use. Since you had a lot of good information about what tools you use, kind of lessons learned from all of those. So uh, of the a question from Greg, of the tools you use for monitoring to show presence absence, uh, visual estimates, eDNA, et cetera, how sensitive are those monitoring tools to detect frogs? Is there a density below which you won't likely detect with the tools you have access to if frogs are actually present? Yeah, I mean, and of course the answer is always, it depends. Um, <laughs> Cause with the eDNA, you know, the pH of the water will cause DNA um, degradation. So different pHs will cause you know, the DNA to be present for longer or shorter. Um, and, but I guess in general, you know, we've been working with the University of Washington on the best protocols to use, um, given the factors that we have and how much light, you know, gets into the water column and all of that. Um, water, I, my understanding is that if we collect water from like the surface areas, that that gives you a pretty reasonable snapshot of what's there right now. And it's very sensitive, like the animal would have been there from like days to weeks from when you um, collect the water and detect in the eDNA um, a positive. Um, so it's, you know, it's very sensitive in that way. And so we've been using that kind of um, for our purpose. I think it works well because if you get a positive detect, you're like, they're here. And if you get a negative detect, you're like, okay, they're probably not here. And, and also, you know, you can do, if you're in the stage of your eradication where you're like having so much, so much area that you want to run, you can run a composite sample, you know, that includes water that was taken from multiple areas, you know, every 20 meters or every 40 meters of, of shoreline um, and run a composite sample, or you can run more specific ones for those areas. So, um, and also taking multiple eDNA samples throughout the season, that can give you more confidence. So you can really um, tailor, use the eDNA to kind of root out those last individuals and hone down like where are the areas that we really need to be focusing on. Um, but yeah, I mean, working with Karen Goldberg from the University of Washington has been like really crucial because again, there's so many questions regarding the sensitivity and like, what do I do? And like, how can I be confident that they're that they're being detected if they're there. Um, but she has a lot more of that expertise and, and the papers behind that are pretty promising as far as its specificity, especially in like backwater areas versus like flowing water. Like we're not taking water for most of that directly like out of the middle of the river. We're using areas where the water has like good retention. Yeah, yeah, and that actually, uh, that's great. And that speaks to a question from Boyd too about uh, any concern with legacy eDNA from the lake burials. Um, I'm not sure how that's gonna be dealt with. I know that they studied that, um, Colleen Kamaroff, if you look up her name, she has a paper that was done on some of the data from our, um, she was looking for that, you know, similar thing and did goldfish kind of looking for legacy effects because we were concerned about that in employing eDNA with some of our fish removal work in the high elevation lakes. We're like, well, can we use eDNA to like tell us that like the fish are gone? Um, and there was some pretty promising results. Again, if you're collecting it from like more of the top of the water column, then, you know, you can be more certain. But if you were to like desert, disturb a bunch of sediment, um, then that might be more of an issue. So, um, yeah. yeah, gotcha. And I'm not sure, you know, we haven't reached the point at some of those lakes. The lakes that we're looking at with the bullfrogs are more shallow than the lakes that we're working at with, with the um, fish removal. And so there's also probably some like turnover and seasonal stuff that has to be considered, but I don't think they're, they haven't gotten there yet with that portion of the project um, as far as as far as I understand, I don't, I don't think that an eDNA plan has yet been developed for gravel pit and swamp, but that'll, those will probably be things that they definitely consider. Totally. Great. 
Um, thanks for those details. Uh, there's several questions about really specific technical aspects that I want to get to, but I also want to ask this question. Um, was there any effort to quantify the effect to the native species assemblage? So again, we wish we had had more just like VES surveys in the beginning to like be able to compare that. Um, but we didn't have, we didn't have that data available to us for the Yosemite Valley effort. As far as um, the work that's going on at Swamp and Gravel Pit, we're having some really encouraging, um, you know, anecdotal data. And again, we're not done with, but I mean, we do have the visual encounter surveys at those sites to kind of know what a snapshot of things looked like um, before we started the eradication work. And um, definitely are noticing like more uh, chorus frog tadpoles, noticing more uh, Tarika, uh, the little um, Sierra Newts, noticing more of those up at those sites. Um, you know, the, the, the turtle data from those lakes, they do have um, Western pond turtle. It's kind of up at the elevational kind of like range limit um, for that species. And the two lakes that had a ton of bullfrogs like really didn't show any turtle recruitment. Whereas there's lakes around there that are you know, very, very close by that don't have bullfrogs where the recruitment looks really good. So, you know, we're, we're, that data is starting to be elucidated and there's, um, I wish I would have grabbed it for this um, presentation, but there's a cool recording that shows, it was kind of like the before and after of um, recordings of just what those lakes sounded like when bullfrogs were there with just the cacophonous like calling of the bullfrogs. And now it's just, you just hear chorus frogs, you know, so that's, yeah. On those, that, on those two field sites, that data is, is coming out. Super cool. And that leads me well into my next question, was, which was, how effective were your audio recorders? And there are a couple questions about the specific audio um, software and hardware that you were using. That, that I would have to talk to Rob about. I wasn't um, super involved in that portion of the project. But because we're a big park, we have a um, staff ornithologist. <laughs> Um, and also bat people that have had really good um, experience previously with using song meters and using like bat, you know, bat call detection data um, with similar kind of devices. So I think that we relied on them for some of it, but um, that would be a question. Um, if, if, I, if people are interested, you can email me and then I can flip it to Rob Grasso and he's the one um, that has the most recent um, information on what we did for that. Great. Um, there are so many great questions and I want to honor everybody's time. So I think I'm going to cut us off there. Uh, but I want to thank everyone for taking the time to join us. Uh, this webinar was recorded and made available on the CCAST YouTube channel. Um, if you missed the previous webinars, those recordings have been posted as well. Uh, you can find our channel by searching for CCAST YouTube. Um, as many of you know, we are in the midst of a workshop series for American bullfrog and green sunfish, uh, two of our problematic invasive species in the southwest. Uh, please contact us if you would like more information on these workshops and we can get you um, materials and registration links for those. Uh, finally, we recently announced our next webinar on February 25th when we will learn about the Fishes of Texas project. Um, and in March, we'll feature another landscape scale bullfrog removal effort, this time in southern Arizona, which will be really cool to compare the two. Uh, please contact us if you would like to receive the webinar announcements, uh, but are not yet on our mailing lists. Um, I'm going to drop a couple of these links in the chat, or if Matt hasn't already. Um, otherwise, we thank you all for your time, and thank you so much, Jeanette, for such an excellent presentation. Um, Lots of really great background information about, you know, the area and space in which you were working. Uh, we hope that everybody has a wonderful rest of their day. Thank you. And if anyone has additional questions, feel free to hit my email and I'll try to get those either answered myself or get them to the person that can get you an answer.